Welcome back to Acosta's Anatomy. I'm Travis Ray, and in this lecture, we're going to discuss cortisol. Before I get started, uh, make sure to like and subscribe. So the first thing I'll say about cortisol is what its overall function is. What does it do? So cortisol is a catabolic hormone. So cortisol is a catabolic hormone that helps to regulate our blood glucose levels. Cortisol is also uh, responsible for helping with stress, so helping to resist stress, so stress resistance. So the next thing is, well, what's the normal secretion of cortisol? So typically, uh, cortisol levels are, they peak in the morning around 7, 8 a.m. And then throughout the day, these levels, they start to decrease. So they'll decrease until, you know, they, they'll reach their lowest levels around, you know, 10, 11 p.m. So then from there, the cycle will continue. And so this is what's known as a di, it's, it's known as a diurnal pattern. So then what about when th these cortisol levels, when they're secreted in excess? So there's a couple of different things. So both of them, so we're reducing immunity, the immune response. And then another thing that's reduced is inflammation. So an anti-inflammatory, so known as an anti-inflammatory. So decreased inflammation. And so uh, one of the things that's used, so cortico corticosteroids, this is commonly used to um, treat, so for instance, um, allergies, as well as <clears throat> allergies, as well as rheumatoid arthritis. So with rheumatoid arthritis, this is uh, inflammation within those joints. And so by administering uh, corticosteroids, this will help to reduce some of that inflammation. Okay, so the next thing is the regulation of the secretion. How do we uh, regulate the release of, of cortisol? So cortisol uh, utilizes the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And it utilizes what's known as a negative feedback mechanism. So this negative feedback, let's, let's write this up here. So you have the HPA axis. And we're already familiar with how this works as far as the pathway here. So you have the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus will secrete something specific known as corticotropin releasing hormone. And then from there, it'll then get into the anterior pituitary gland. From the anterior pituitary gland, we release something that's known as adrenocorticotropic hormone. From there, it'll then travel to the adrenal gland. And then once we're within the adrenal gland, cortisol will be released. And then it'll travel to its, travel to its target tissue. But the negative feedback mechanism is, so once these cortisol levels, now once they've reached adequate levels, the negative feedback, so it'll go to first off here at the anterior pituitary where it will inhibit the release of ACTH, and then also will inhibit the release of uh, corticotropin-releasing hormone by the hypothalamus. And some of the different uh, target tissues, so you have, first off, you have the muscle, you also have the liver, as well as fat tissue. Okay, so that's the regulation, the, the regulation of the secretion of cortisol. So now the next thing is, let's get into the actual pathway itself. What happens? So how is uh, cortisol actually synthesized? And then what is the effect that it has within these specific uh, types of tissues? So the first thing we have to do is we have to add a stimulus. So this stimulus can be, it can be either trauma, right? So different types of trauma, you can have either physical, so for instance, like you get into a fight or something like that, those cortisol levels would increase, or just like emotional trauma. So for instance, during finals, it's a very uh, stressful, a stressful time, and so uh, cortisol levels are going to be higher during this time. So then you also have 
infection, which can lead to inflammation. So these levels of cortisol are going to be increased. Okay, so now let's look here at this pathway. So first off, you add that stimulus, and then the hypothalamus from there will get the releasing hormone into the anterior pituitary. And from the anterior pituitary, this is what's going to release ACTH. And ACTH, uh, where this comes from, is a particular uh, region within the anterior pituitary. These specific cells, they're known as corticotrophs. So these corticotrophs, they release ACTH, and then they have to get to the adrenal gland. And within the adrenal gland, there is a specific region known as the adrenal. So you have the adrenal cortex. So that's what I have. This is the, this cell, the adrenal cortex. More specifically, it's a region within the adrenal cortex known as the zona fasciculata. So let me show you this kidney model here. So this here is the kidney. And then this is the adrenal gland. So you have the adrenal cortex, which is here on the outside, and then the adrenal medulla is here on the inside. So the zona fasciculata, that's a particular region here within the adrenal cortex. Okay, so what happens once ACTH binds to its receptor within the zona fasciculata? So ACTH, this is a peptide or a protein hormone, it's going to bind here to its receptor. And then from there, we'll stimulate a pathway that we're already familiar with. So this pathway will increase the levels of our cyclic AMP, and as a result, we'll activate our protein kinase A. Remember, once again, kinases, they add phosphate groups to things. And so uh, what will occur here is we'll activate the enzymes that are necessary in order to synthesize cortisol from cholesterol. So we'll add phosphate groups to these particular enzymes and then synthesize cortisol. So then from there, cortisol will then get into the blood. And once it gets into the blood, it needs a carrier because uh, cortisol is it's not water soluble, so it needs a carrier. And some of the different carriers that you have, so uh, first off, you have something uh, which is known as albumin. And then, or it can also bind to what's known as uh, cortico, it's known as a corticotropin binding uh, globulin. Corticotropin binding globulin. So cortisol can bind to either of these it gets there into the blood and then it will then travel to its target tissue. So I'm going to write this over here. So adrenal cortex, so here to the target, target tissue. So then once it gets to its target tissue, cortisol is going to diffuse here. Once it diffuses into the target tissue, it binds to its receptor. So this here, well, this will represent the receptor. This is going to represent DNA, and then, so this will be DNA, and then this is a gene there. So cortisol will then bind to something which is known as the, let's see where I'll write this over here. It's known as the glucocorticoid. Let's see, I'm going to write this a little bit over this way. So glucocorticoid receptor. So it'll bind to the glucocorticoid receptor and then from there translocation will occur. We can activate the transcription factors and then synthesize the necessary enzymes. So then what are, once again, what are some of the uh, target tissue types? So you have the muscle, you have the liver, as well as fat. So what happens once we get here into the muscle tissue? So the specific enzymes that we're going to uh, synthesize include our proteases. So we're synthesizing these proteases 
in order to increase the amino acid levels. So we're increasing these amino acid levels and then once we get to the liver, what will happen is gluconeogenesis. So once cortisol binds to its receptor, the enzymes that it's going to synthesize, they're going to help make more glucose. And so as a result, we're going to increase our blood glucose levels so we can feed the brain. Because the brain is a glucose hog. Okay, so then what about the, in the fat tissue? So from there, we're going to synthesize our lipase enzymes. And the lipase enzymes, lipolysis is going to occur. So we'll put lipolysis. As a result, we're going to increase the fatty acids. And so these fatty acids, this can be metabolic fuel, right? So we're making, so to meet the energy demands for, this will be used for muscle. Another thing to mention is that here, once we make these amino acids, once they get into the blood, they can be transported here to the liver, so that way gluconeogenesis um, can occur. Another thing with the um, amino acids, so we're increasing these levels, because when you think about like inflammation and infection, if there's um, damage to that tissue, we need to uh, repair that. So we have to have an adequate amount of amino acids in order to do that. All right, so that's gonna do it for cortisol.